Uh, and a group of uh, scholars over the past couple of decades have really made it uh, their business to see if they could get rigorous about the study of the faith factor. And the leader of the group uh, is here uh, with us today. Uh, Byron uh, Johnson, who's going to uh, be our principal uh, speaker, uh, is Distinguished Professor of Social Sciences at Baylor University. He's the founding director of the Baylor Institute for Studies of uh, Religion, as well as director of the program on pro-social behavior. Uh, he's a senior fellow of the Witherspoon Institute here in Princeton and a senior research scholar at the Institute for Jewish and Community Research. He's also chief advisor uh, for the Center for the Study of Religion and Chinese Society at Peking, Peking University uh, in Beijing. Now, before joining uh, the faculty down at uh, Baylor, uh, Byron directed research centers at Vanderbilt University in Nashville and uh, down the road at the University of Pennsylvania. He recently completed a series of empirical uh, studies for the Department of Justice on the role of religion in pro-social youth behavior, and he's a member of the Coordinating Council for Juvenile and Delinquency Prevention, uh, and that's a presidential appointment, actually. He's recognized as the leading authority on the scientific study of religion and the efficacy of faith-based institutions in uh, prisons, yes, but not just in prisons, in the delivery of social services more generally. Uh, and he studied the faith factor when it comes to matters of domestic uh, violence as well. His recent publications have examined the impact of faith-based programs on recidivism, return of prisoners to crime, uh, and uh, prisoner re-entry. Uh, he's the author of a terrific uh, new book, which will be the basis of uh, his presentation uh, this morning. A terrific new book that I commend to all of you uh, called, called More God, Less Crime, and the subtitle of that book is Why Faith Matters and How It Could Matter More. And that book is available from uh, Templeton uh, Press, and as I say, it was just published, so it's a 2011 volume. He is working with the Gallup Organization, headquartered here in Princeton, on studies exploring religion and spirituality uh, in the world. He earned his uh, PhD in criminology from Florida State. University. So I'm going to uh, introduce now uh, Byron Johnson, who will speak for about 20 minutes, uh, and then I will return to, inter uh, to uh, introduce our distinguished uh, commentators. Uh, they'll make their remarks, and then we're going to have an open discussion. So uh, Byron Johnson. Well, it's good to be back uh, in Princeton and back in this neck of the woods. I know so many people that are here. Um, I noticed Mark O'Brien walked in. Mark and I commuted to Princeton quite a bit in his car, not mine. It's a newer, nicer car than mine. It's always like Mark's car. Is it more lucrative business? That's right. It's good to see Brad Wilson also, and to, to be on the panel with uh, John, uh, my dear friend. My family adopted John, so you all know him as John Delio. We know him as John Delio Johnson. That's correct. Uh, my brother's an attorney. He did paperwork. It's been about 10 years ago. And uh, of course, Gene Rivers and I go way back too. And so it's, it's great to be with Robbie and, and the rest of the gang. Let me just start out by saying um, this book, in case you haven't seen it, um, one of the things I wanted to make clear, and of course Luis Tellez, my good buddy, I remember when the Witherspoon Institute was Luis and myself in a little cuddy hole <laughs> gathered around an air conditioner in the summer to stay cool and a nice building to Dynasty, so it's good to see Luis. But um, I wanted to make the case uh, just based on data. And um, so uh, the, the book reviews a large number of studies. Um, I reviewed about 273 empirical studies on religion and some measure of delinquency or crime or human behavior. And what we found, if you look at the, the entire literature, is that about 90% of these studies find an inverse relationship. The more there is some kind of religious commitment, the less likely you are to see some kind of criminal or delinquent behavior. I gave a paper in November at the American Society of Criminology meetings this last November in San Francisco, and the former president of the American Society of Criminology was the respondent, Frank Cullen. And his response was quite shocking to me. He said, I'm embarrassed, but I did not know this. Hmm. He had also been the president of the American Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences. And, you know, Frank is he's a genius, and he knew of some of the studies. He had, in fact, read some of mine. 
but he was stunned because most of the scholars that do research in this area say, we know this, that there's mixed evidence. So when you look at the literature, do you find there's mixed evidence? I found two studies out of 273 that found some kind of harmful outcome from religion. And when you look at the research methodology, these two studies used the you know, weak methods. So the better the methodology, the more likely you are to find this effect. Frank Hillen also said something rather interesting. He had read my paper before the conference, so he was so disturbed that he didn't know this. He pulled every criminology book off of his shelf and every criminal justice text off his shelf and looked through them to find references to religion and found none in any of the books that he reviewed. So that day in November in San Francisco, he immediately called for a new section to emerge within the field dedicated to the scientific, scientific study of religion, which is quite remarkable because when John Giulio and I first started doing this work back in the 80s, there really was hardly no literature to be found. And so just a couple of decades later to hear the president of the former president say that we need a new section, uh, that's how important this is, I thought was quite compelling. I will say this for those of you that are quantitative researchers, we're in the process of completing a meta-analysis. In the book, I do a, what we call a systematic review, where we look at all the studies, we look at their methods, we look at their findings, we look to see how strong they are. But we don't do what meta-analyses do, and that is you actually compare coefficients and correlations, and it gets complicated, but you can actually weight these things, and that's what we're in the process of doing, which will be the next product. I wanted to mention something. So far, I've had very few critics to come out. I was expecting more, and I'm sure that will happen shortly. But you can predict what the critics will say about a book like this and about studies like this because I've seen it over the last 25 years when I've submitted articles for publication. You get FLRs. That's a funny looking review. Um, and the thing that they cry about is selection bias. There's selection bias in this study or there's um, some, something that doesn't feel right. I had one guy uh, make a comment to the editor, I, I just can't vote to publish this piece because I sniff that something is a foul. Well, when you get a review from a, an, uh, an anonymous reviewer, they're usually pretty lethal. You know, it, and it's not too hard to find something to complain about. But this, this person said, I can't put my finger on it, but there's something wrong with this paper, so I vote not to accept it for publication. I remember saying to the editor, why don't you publish the piece? Let this person say what's wrong with it, and then let me respond to that person. And so the editor called me back the next day and said, he's decided to let you go ahead and publish it straight out. Um, the, the person didn't want to take me on. Um, let me talk about selection bias for a second. Selection bias is the idea that who cares if you find there's some kind of an effect when you cream the crop and you put all the good cases into one group and you study them and you find out that the intervention works. This is selection bias. Well, we do what we can to eliminate selection bias. Um, and, and by doing that, the only way you can really do it is to randomly assign it. But it gets a little complicated to randomly assign people to a faith-based intervention. A lot of people have a legal problem with that. And well, they should. So we can't approach that. So we do quasi-experimental designs where we match people that look just like someone else, everything else being controlled for. Uh, but that's not good enough. It's not good enough for some. And so I hear this all the time, which is interesting because a lot of my studies have been on prisoners. So I'm thinking, how do you cream the crop? <laughs> I mean, come on, let's, let's, let's be reasonable. Well, you know, the, the only guys that really made it were the guys that really had religion already. You know, the Billy Grahams of the prison. So it's kind of interesting how people talk about selection bias. Um, so are you saying that religion does matter? It just so happens that the, 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 they self-selected into the program? Even there, they're acknowledging that there might be something to it. I would argue that selection bias is a I would argue any time you have a faith-based intervention, especially in a correctional setting, you're going to get the toughest nuts to crack that sign up for it. Because those are the people that sign up for everything. Anything that might help, they would sign up for. I interviewed chaplains, wardens, correctional officers, administrators. I said, tell me about this faith-based thing. What do you think? Who will come into it? Who will sign up for it? And they said, the worst inmates will sign up for it. There'll be some that are not so bad, but the worst will sign up for it. And, and if it works with them, it'll work with anybody. And so 
oftentimes when you hear the selection bias issue, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it's there, but it's probably running in the other direction. Let me skip ahead real quick and talk about something that I mentioned in the book that's one of the core things about the book is why does religion matter? Why does it matter? The interesting thing is you could argue that religion matters for some people and not for others, which is a true statement. But the, the, the thing that's remarkable is that we find in study after study, religion matters for kids, teenagers, adults, drug abusers, convicts, people post-prison, for blacks, for whites, for women, for men. Religion is a very powerful variable. And why is that the case? Why, and there are any number of reasons why you could speculate, and I offer a lot of them in the book, but I'll just touch on a, a few of them right now, especially in the lives of offenders. A, religion represent, a con religious conversion represents a turning point in a life. And some of you are going to say, well, that's, that's not too profound of a statement. But imagine, if you will, that you're a four-time loser, as we say, in, in the corrections business. All you've ever really known is bouncing around from institution to institution. And you have to admit, when someone asks you about your life, it's not a pretty story. So you have two options. One, I'm a complete loser. Or number two, I've been the victim of a system that's treated me wrong. And I really didn't do anything wrong in the first place. Well, what we find is that when someone experiences some kind of a spiritual transformation, it allows them to start over. It allows them for the first lot time in their life to reconcile their past. I'm not proud of what I've done. I remember one inmate said to me after he got out of prison and he made it on the outside. He said, you know, Byron, I'm not proud of what I've done, but I'm proud of who I've become. Mm -hmm. And to know him, it was saying a lot. He was able to completely rewrite the script of his life, the narrative of his life. And he would say he could only do that through this power of spiritual transformation. I don't know that you can underestimate this. And for the first time in the last couple of years, you now see secular social scientists acknowledging that if we are ever going to have any kind of hope for rehabilitation, something has to trigger in the brain. You don't just want to change. There has to be something that allows you to change. And now they're beginning to understand that maybe, just maybe, faith could be a trigger. This is why I always say to people, and it gets me into all kinds of arguments with my evangelical friends, that a conversion is important, but it's, it's inadequate. And for a lot of them, you, some of you won't remember this, especially you younger ones, but you older ones will. Remember that little cream commercial? A little dabble did it. Well, this is how a lot of people are with Jesus. A little dab of Jesus will do you. And, um, yeah, I knew you would know, brother. <laughs> My good friend Sam. Um, and so I've argued with people. I said, it's not enough to go in there and share some scriptures and pray a sinner's prayer with somebody. It's just not enough. You may have introduced them to Jesus, but they'll be, they'll be taking Jesus right back with them to the slammer in a few months if someone doesn't help them in other ways. The other thing that I think is important that comes with faith and religion are other people, support networks. This is a profoundly important matter, no matter how we look at it. In the book, I talk about the Imaji program that was the, the dream of John DiIulio. In 10 years in this country, we saw 100,000 children of prisoners match with a caring adult um, because of, of that dream that John had. And what was it all about? It was about mentoring. And I think, unfortunately, when we think of mentoring, we think of kids. Well, we now know it matters for adults. Adults need mentor, mentors in their lives, too. And so what I argue is, where we have found an effect, recidivism reduction for adults, people ask me, is it the religion? I say, well, I think it's the mentoring. Oh, so you're saying it's not the religion. Well, I'm not saying that, because the mentors are faith-based mentors. Mm -hmm. They only do this because they feel compelled to do this. Some of them will tell you it's hard work. They don't even like it. They'd rather not go into the projects to mentor, but they have to. They're compelled to do it. So I would say that that is religion, but maybe in an indirect way. I had one 
prisoner that I studied for six years, and I would call him Johnny most likely to come back to prison, okay? And everybody felt the same way. All the staff, the inmates, everybody, and he made it. So one night, I'm talking to him on parole. My wife put up with me going out in the middle of the night in the projects, talking to these guys for years. And I said, how'd you make it? He said, my mentor. I couldn't let him down. I just couldn't do it. He invested all that time in me. I could not let him down. I think that's important. These faith-based programs bring something. They bring accountability. They bring responsibility. If you've ever been into a prison, you'll find that they're loud places and there's all kinds of things going on there. I talked about the, the inmate code. There are certain kinds of behaviors that you exhibit. There's certain do's and don'ts in prison life. It's a part of a subculture. But when you bring faith into a prison in a program that's systematically faith-based, it says that model doesn't work. You have to do things differently. And when you see those two collide, it's pretty remarkable. And um, the, the, the prison that I studied in Houston in, from 1997 to 2003 was half faith-based and half general population about 201 and 200 in the other. The differences were night and day. I remember when it started, Chuck Colson said, let's keep them separate. We don't want the general population to contaminate what's going on over here. Well, after about two months, Chuck realized he was wrong. All the people on the faith-based side wanted to reach out to the inmates in the general population, and the general population inmates were begging to get into the faith-based program. They wanted what those guys were getting, so they tore down all the rules to allow them to, to mingle. And then there's this thing called spiritual growth and spiritual development. I do think that this is a, a, a really important area for us to study. It's a hard area for us to study. But I think after interviewing people for six years, I got an idea of how they were growing and maturing in their faith. And even then, these guys are so fragile. It doesn't take much for a person who's just out of prison to relapse and go back into prison. And the, the tailspin is dramatically fast. This is where the mentors are so important. Let me share a, a few concluding remarks that I think are really important for us as we think about next steps. I just got back from California where some of you may have heard this recent Supreme Court decision that California must now release 46,000 prisoners and the state is in utter panic. And so I had a chance to talk to the sheriff from L.A. while I was out there, and they're looking for anything. They're looking for help. And they're looking to the faith community. That's a place they weren't looking to a decade ago, but they are now. These things, I think, will help us as we look forward. Partnerships. The government hasn't been very good at it, and neither has the faith community, in my estimation. But there's been plenty of blame to go around on both sides. I think the problems that are confronting us are so large that we need to think about these partnerships. I think government needs people of faith, but at the same time, I think people of faith need what government can bring them, which is accountability and oversight. It's not enough to say we know our programs work and that we answer to God and not to anybody else. That answer, that response just doesn't cut it for me anymore. So I think it's not by faith alone or not by government alone but it's about partnerships, and I know that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. And then the last thing I, I want to talk about for just a second here is, re, uh, is the, not the re-entry piece, but more importantly, the, the intermediary piece. You all know of the United Way, but what we really need is a faith-based United Way that brings together groups that are trying to do good work, they just don't know how. Many of them are very weak, and their efforts cannot reach scale. And for someone like me, a social scientist, it's all about scale. It's not can we build an exemplary program, it's how can we build something that we can take elsewhere. Urban, rural, it doesn't matter. And I think that these intermediaries can help us in some interesting ways build capacity in these organizations. So many of these, I call them mom and pop operations. These are people that feel compelled to serve, but they don't know how, because no one's really shown them how. This is where I think a faith-based intermediary can play a key role, and we have some of these organizations that are doing just that. And um, those are remarkable entities, but just give us a glimpse. And I think these intermediaries hold the key to unlocking these houses of worship, some 380,000 
across this country full of people that are willing and able. They just need to be asked. Colin Powell did a survey uh, for his group about a decade ago, and he wanted to know why people volunteered. And the number one reason why people volunteer is that someone took the time to ask them. I just don't think that we've been smart enough in our houses of worship to think about how to approach people in a way that would be meaningful and could target some of our most difficult problems. Thank you. Thank you, Byron. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome to uh, the Madison program here at Princeton for the first time, Professor Beverly. Fraser, and I'm sure it's not going to be the last time, Beverly. Uh, professor Fraser is assistant professor in the Law, Police, Science, and Criminal Justice Administration Department at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, one of our nation's most distinguished uh, institutions of higher learning devoted to uh, the study of criminal justice. She's also a senior fellow at the University of Pennsylvania School of Arts and Sciences and the Fox Leadership Program, where she's completed her first book, which is on the role of faith-based organizations in the process of prisoner uh, re-entry, and uh, her work has been used as a model uh, for programs around the country. Dr. Fraser's perspectives on the criminal justice system are formed not only by her academic or scholarly research and teaching, but also, but also by her direct experience uh, working as a public information officer for the Jersey City uh, Police Department here in uh, New Jersey. Dr. Fraser's work uh, contributed to advancements in improving the relationship between the mostly African American communities uh, uh, in the New Jersey, uh, in, in Jersey City, New Jersey, and the police department there. Professor R uh, Fraser received her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. It's a great uh, pleasure, Beverly, to have you with us. Professor Fraser. John Delio of the University of Pennsylvania, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Bobby Job, sorry, sorry, George, of the Madison uh, program here at Princeton for inviting me today. It is a pleasure uh, to be here uh, in the discussion of this provocative topic of religion and crime, and further, uh, the religion, religion and the criminal justice uh, system. I applaud Dr. Johnson uh, for this valuable contribution. Uh, to the public discourse of the role of faith in the ongoing debate of what works in crime prevention and uh, crime reduction, as well as reducing recidivism. Uh, the book raises many important issues and various aspects of the topic and outlines a fundamental and compelling argument for first acknowledging that faith-based interventions work, and secondly, support for more of the same. Um, while I found many intriguing aspects of the book, because of my own uh, interest in prisoner research, um, I was drawn to the book's treatment of faith-based prisoner reentry, and therefore will focus my comments today on the book's treatment of that topic. First, as the book argued, I agree that there is empirical evidence that faith-based prisoner reentry programs have varying measures of success. Research shows that the role of religion or the practice of faith, specifically in a faith community, provides undeniable sources of both social and spiritual capital, as well as compelling, as well as provide a compelling source for informal social control. Combining the transformative power of a message of hope, grace, and empowerment, along with mentoring and collaborative social and supportive services, faith-based prisoner reentry provides a holistic model of pro-social reintegration. First, the discussion on spiritual transformation highlights the notion of repentance, or in the New Testament Greek, it's called metanoia, or to change one's mind for the better, a turning in direction. It connotes a new perspective for those who are following a life of crime and turning uh, to a spiritual transformation or change. Um, there's no doubt that this is imperative. 
And religion, or more specifically, the conversion experience, as seen in research, has uh, been noted as light coming on, as uh, noted in one uh, university, uh, uh, sorry, Urban Institute study. While there is um, issue about the form or so source of this changing of one's mind, there is no debate that transformation in spirit or mind, um, though not in these terms, is paramount as fundamental to the discussion of desisting from criminal behavior. So there must be a change. Secondly, some form of mentoring or emotional or spiritual support as seen in the examples found in the book are, um, uh, and other faith-based prisoner reentry programs found that throughout the country um, there has been success in these programs. While social support is the most reasonable explanation for this, so is the notion of informal social control. It can be argued that the power of expectation, as Dr. Johnson just mentioned, uh, for pro-social integration combined with spiritual and emotional support to that end is intrinsically redeeming. In addition, an entire community of believers who supports one's success is a powerful source. I also argue that, that, in the, re that the research also shows that uh, those who attend religious instruction regularly or participate in religious activities uh, can also be explained through uh, the impact of peer mentoring um, and support or as again Dr. Johnson mentioned, expectation, the expectation of the faith community that influences the currents of anti-social behavior. Um, so uh, just to give you an example in the book there was mention of uh, juvenile delinquent programs, a study that showed that those youth that participated, teens that participated in religious programs were less likely to engage in antisocial behavior. So again, here faith-based programs are looked at uh, prevented, crime prevention interventions, preventative uh, measures. And so in this case, again, the idea of having the uh, social support as well as the informal social support, uh, informal social control of the peer groups, the peers of the other teens that are involved, as well as the entire faith community supporting this, anti, this uh, pro-social behavior uh, can be uh, seen as very successful in keeping teens from participating in criminal behavior. Thirdly, I found in my own research, uh, in addition to what's been noted in uh, Dr. Johnson's book, that faith-based reentry uh, must include all stages, incarceration, post-release, and post-supervision. While the literature of faith-based prison and prison ministries show significant levels of su success, traditionally the main focus has been on the incarceration stage of reentry and not on post-release or even post-supervision stages. The, uh, the book discusses, the, and, and again was just recently mentioned, previously mentioned by Dr. Johnson, uh, not by faith alone. So that the challenges of, of faith-based prisoner reentry providers is not only to support or uh, provide the spiritual needs uh, during incarceration, but to also uh, provide post-release support. Uh, that comes in the form of assistance in finding employment, assistance in finding housing, assistance in uh, drug rehabilitation. As I found in my own research, that the community institutional capacity of these communities um, uh, while is very strong, again, there does need to be uh, continual efforts to build the capacity of these organizations to network so that collaborations and networking, not only with other faith institutions, but with other social and supportive services, create a holistic approach to the reentry process. Um, so it goes without. Uh, uh, saying that the role of uh, faith-based uh, prisoner reentry is a very, very important element in the discussion. The one thing, though, that I think is uh, very important that we can't um, set aside um, as a professor that spends a lot of time talking about criminal justice policy as well as um, the nexus of race and crime, um, there, there is this 
ideological dynamic that looks at um, the causes of crime in terms of cultural, structural factors, cultural behavior factors, and of structural factors. So on the one hand, there's this notion that uh, people that commit crime are, uh, are, are not victims, but are um, consequences. They, they are outcomes of structural forces. So these structural forces are not just socioeconomic forces or environmental forces or, or lifestyle forces. They're also structural forces that can be found in every aspect of the criminal justice system, from law enforcement to the courts to corrections. So recently you saw, just a couple of days ago in Manhattan, councilwoman um, who was uh, protesting in front of uh, Mayor Bloomberg's mansion because uh, within certain communities, African Americans and Latinos were constantly stopped, frisked, and searched uh, for drugs, and therefore, again, attribute to the um, uh, disproportion uh, that we see, the disparity that we see of African Americans within the criminal justice system. The structural also speaks to um, the issues of what's considered criminal. You know, how do we criminalize? What's a class one felony? Why is it a class one? Why does it carry the penalty that it carries? This is all germane to the discussion of reentry because the longer prison stays are part and parcel of the, uh, the reason that two thirds of those who come out of prison or jail return because they're staying longer, along with the fact that a lot of the rehabilitative programs, such as faith-based uh, faith programs, are no longer there. Right? So, um, so there's, this, there's a structural piece that's important. But, um, and so I'm not suggesting that faith-based organizations should participate in that. But one of the things in, in changing that, there are reforms. There's a national uh, reform. There's several acts that are reforming some of these structural uh, disparities. Um, so I'm not suggesting that faith-based organizations should be participate in that, but one of the things that I also found in looking at community institutional capacity for faith-based organizations is that, um, that advocacy was the one thing that was missing. That people who could not go back to school because they had a felony record, they could not go back to school because they couldn't get a, a student loan, um, weren't allowed to vote, so they were no longer a part of the citizenry. Those kinds of issues that faith-based organizations uh, don't address as much as maybe that they should address. That's the, that's the one thing. But the, the thing, and I'll make this really short, the thing that, um, that, that, that kind of sticks out that has nothing to do with the, the impact or the success of faith-based organizations, but just along the discussion of, uh, uh, in the public discourse of what works, the, the notion that, um, that, 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 that the transformation, the change, the metanoia, the, the repentance, is, is, the, is the central focus of reentry. Means that crime, um, recidivism, um, is, is basically rooted in behavior. So if I could fix you, I'll put you in a religious context, or give you religious, some kind of religious intervention, if I can fix you, then I can fix the problem. Um, and so it, it, it lies squarely on the individual. And that on one hand, that's extremely empowering. Um, it's, it, it takes away the stigma of determinism, um, that if, if you're born in a certain context, that, that, that means that you're going to be born into crime. Um, it also gives you back your autonomy as an individual and, and makes you the person that's responsible, that's that personal responsibility for your behavior, regardless of all of these things that, that structural forces against you. Um, on the other hand, if we, as in terms of the government, in terms of government support, use uh, faith-based uh, interventions um, as a way of ignoring the structural, uh, then we've done ourselves uh, uh, an injustice. Um, across the street, when I was finishing up my Master's of Divinity um, over at the seminary, uh, Professor Diulio was heading off to D.C to head the first Office of Faith-Based and Community uh, Initiatives. And, uh, and I did a paper in one of my classes, one of the last papers <laughs> I did, uh, on uh, what he was organizing uh, there in DC. And that was kind of my central argument. My central argument is that faith works, right? So we don't want to negate that, but we also don't want to use it as a, as a, as a reason not to do the other things. 
Um, so I kind of ended the paper how in the, the same way in which I'll uh, end my comments, and that is my mother used to say, uh, you don't cut off your nose to spite your face. Uh, or in other words, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, the research shows that faith-based organizations and faith-based interventions makes a difference in crime prevention, uh, crime reduction, and reducing recidivism. Uh, we embrace that, we celebrate that, and, uh, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Johnson, for your contribution. introducing my great friend, Pastor Eugene Rivers III. Uh, Pastor Rivers leads the Azusa Christian Community, which is a Pentecostal church located in the Four Corners section of Dorchester, uh, Massachusetts. He also serves as interim director of the L.J. Baker House, a nonprofit uh, <coughs> organization originally created by the Azusa Christian Community to provide street intervention, education, and mentoring for thousands of youth in Dorchester and elsewhere uh, in Boston. And when I say street intervention, I mean street intervention. Pastor Rivers works on the street, grabbing gang members by the scruff of the neck and the hauling them into church uh, and other, uh, other dangerous places. Uh, <laughs> he serves as an analyst for MSNBC and has appeared on MSNBC's Hardball and Good Morning Joe. MSNBC, would they? Yes, uh, Charlie Rose Show, Fox's Hannity and Combs. There you go. And yeah. the <laughs> the so there we go. National <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, we everything. <laughs> Pastor Rivers has been featured. Many of you, I'm sure, saw the, uh, saw the uh, cover story in Newsweek magazine several years ago, in which Professor Giulio, uh, his cooperation with Pastor Rivers was uh, was highlighted, uh, was featured in a cover story of. Uh, Newsweek, uh, where his uh, uh, work uh, finally got uh, the attention I believe it so richly deserves. Uh, Pastor Rivers is what I would call an intellectually engaged social activist. Uh, in, in addition to grabbing gang members by the scruff of the neck, he's also authored or co-authored numerous essays, and the titles of the essays I think are very illustrative of, uh, of Pastor Rivers' uh, you know, perspective. Uh, one, probably the most uh, celebrated and uh, controversial of his essays, was called On the Responsibility of Intellectuals in an Age of Crack. And just suffice it to say that he read the intellectuals the riot act. Uh, another is uh, Beyond the Nationalism of Fools, a Manifesto for a New Black Movement. Another is Black Churches and the Challenges of U.S. Foreign and, de de and Development Policy. Another is an open letter to the U.S. black religious, intellectual, and political leadership regarding AIDS and the sexual holocaust in Africa. Uh, and yet another, uh, a pastoral letter to President George W. Bush on bridging our racial divide, which uh, the pastor sent to the president uh, upon his uh, inauguration in 2001. Uh, the pastor, in addition to his uh, work in Dorchester and in Boston, uh, does an enormous amount of great work uh, related to Africa. He currently serves in an advisory capacity to the presiding bishop of the Church of God in Christ on policy issues with special focus on assisting NGOs in Africa in dealing with the AIDS orphan crisis there, which is so hard. Uh, Pastor Rivers was uh, educated at Harvard University, but we can forgive him for that gene. <laughs> Being Pentecostal, I am now obligated to perform a miracle <laughs> uh, in that my remarks will be briefer than my introduction. <laughs> um, uh, first, I want to thank uh, Professor George, uh, who is, uh, among other things, uh, an intellectual, and actually, no, more than intellectual, a philosophic mentor. Uh, in my copious free time over the last uh, 25 years, as Professor George has uh, indicated, uh, I and my colleagues in Boston uh, sort of split our time between following uh, the, the, the empirical and theoretical, uh, theoretical uh, literature uh, on this subject of what we'll call the faith factor and actually testing uh, the research on the ground. Uh, what we generally found uh, up until sort of the emergence of John Julio's work and Byron's work was that uh, 
The literature was probably 15 years behind what was happening on the ground, uh, which is not surprising. I mean, it's unless you actually get out and do ethnographic research and do field work, right? You, you, you know, there's not a lot of reality you're going to come across sitting behind the computer, peering out over the computer into, you know, sort of the idyllic existence where you cook up all these brilliant ideas, divorced from reality on the planet Earth. And so, um, what is striking, and I want to sort of share this briefly, is that um, this faith factor is actually, I think, uh, for those who actually bother to do the research, much more profound than is sort of indicated in the literature. And I'm going to use two quick anecdotes to sort of illustrate uh, the power of this. I know this empirically by way of personal uh, 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 experience. Uh, my conversion experience uh, was uh, fairly dramatic. I was drafted into a street gang hmm. in our inner city of Philadelphia uh, at the sort of tender age of 12. Uh, a group of young men attempted to drown me in a boys' room latrine in Wagner Junior High School, where I was guilty of the crime of having seen a bully who had wreaked havoc in my life get his comeuppance. Uh, and I was there to witness that and, and, and to celebrate the next day. And so I was, as young people are, you know, indiscreet in reporting that this young man, his name, I, uh, James Troubles Waynes. I remember to this day, James <laughs> Troubles Waynes. His nickname was Troubles. I mean, that was the guy's right. And James Troubles Waynes, right, had uh, uh, humiliated me when I was in fifth grade when I, you know, was stupid enough to stumble across his suede shoes. He was a sixth grader. And I stumbled across his suede shoes, and he made me, in front of the entire assembly, bow and wipe the shoes off, right? So, so that sort of stuck in my mind. Well. You know, as, as you know, as it turned out, God had a plan because uh, uh, Mr. Waynes socially got passed from the Joseph Pennell Elementary School to Wagner Junior High School, and I had the misfortune of having to go to the same junior high school. And and so I go through this experience of seeing this character get his comeuppance. I report it. I am then attacked by a group of young men in a boys' room, uh, and pulled into the gang, given this ultimatum to join this gang. Now, a year later, a year later, I am forced to go out on a campaign uh, led by a young man named Buddy Brown, who had, I'm 13 now, a 38 revolver wrapped in a rag. <coughs> and on a Friday night, we were to go out and there was a young man that I was assigned to murder with the 38 revolver. And as I'm out on that Friday night, my mother had, was a single mom in church, and there is a Sunday school song that we learned in what was the, I was then in the Baptist church before I went into the Pentecostal church. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. When I was given that 38 revolver, that little song flew across my mind as I was assigned to shoot a young boy named Chucky Thomas who had attended the same church I attended. And there was a scuffle and an argument because I refused to shoot Chucky Thomas. The faith factor was the difference between the life and death of Chucky Thomas. It, now, I recall, you know, and, and here again, I did need an elaborate, you know, regression model. <laughs> you know, <laughs> macro theoretical. <laughs> Interrogation of the phenomenon. Yeah. all that, right? The faith factor kicked in in a very practical way. One other anecdote. I remember during this period when I'm wrestling with how I negotiate my life as a young Christian trying to pull out of the gang, a group of young men assaulted a 13 or 14 year old girl. I had been drafted into the gang and I'll put it this way. She was subjected to serial abuse. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I was invited 
to be a participant in this abuse. And uh, I got into a fight again with a young man because I found it so repugnant personally. And here again, nothing elaborate or sophisticated, some very fundamental values, which were a function of the faith that had been given me by my mother. That faith factor made the difference in the lives of every single boy on that street, Levere Street, in West Oak Lane. I rejected the nihilism and the decay. The faith factor is, a, it, it is arguably the most powerful factor for people who are forced to live in context of nihilism and decay. And so I just share with you, and we can get into the discussion. I mean, there's all of the empirical research that Byron and John have left, if you need that. Now, common sense, elementary common sense, and, and some knowledge of the world uh, should be able to bring you to some a fairly basic conclusion, right? So if you need all of that, because common sense does kick in for you, God bless you, we have the scholars here. But if you're reasonably intelligent and you know anything about the world, and you've got a sort of an adult, mature understanding, this should be fairly obvious, and in, in some cases intuitively obvious, right? And so um, I, I want to say that over the next 10 years, the most interesting political discussions in this country in terms of what this society does to deal with the fact that we are, uh, that the poor are suffering in ways that make no rational sense, the faith factor is going to be the key factor that makes the difference in transforming the lives of those who have been left to die. And it's my view that only that factor, and, and, and that people of faith commit themselves to dealing with the biblical issue of justice so that we can resurrect faith and hope for a population of young people for whom faith and hope has died. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Well, now here comes the big boy. Our line up here. If uh, Gene uh, Rivers is, as I said he is, and believe he is, uh, wonderfully intellectually engaged social activist. Uh, Gian Giulio is the model That's right. of a socially engaged intellectual. That's right. You all know the uh, song from Gilbert and Sullivan about the very model of a modern major general. Well, Professor Giulio, with whom I have taught and worked now for many, many years, is the very model of a modern major general in a war against despair, delinquency, drug abuse, and all the other social pathologies that wound and ruin the lives of <coughs> so many young people in inner cities and in rural areas where the curse of drugs, where the curse of violence, where the curse of gangs uh, are just so uh, prevalent. And John has just been out there. He has not been content to sit behind that uh, computer screen. He does his time behind the computer screen. But he's also out there in the prisons. He's out there in the communities. He's working with people like Jim and Reverend Sam here from Trenton and with others uh, around the country. And his work has borne tremendous fruit, some of that Professor Fraser already pointed to. Uh, John DiUlio is the Frederick Fox Leadership Professor of Politics, Religion, and Civil Society at the University of Pennsylvania. Before abandoning us, he taught for 13 years uh, at uh, Princeton, where he was professor of politics and uh, public policy here in the Department of Politics and in the Woodrow Wilson School. Over the last quarter of a century, he's won countless awards and uh, professional uh, recognitions for his teaching and for his writing. Outside of academic life, he's developed programs to mentor the children of prisoners, very, very important, providing literacy training in low-income communities. He's worked to reduce homicides and high crime police districts, and he's done wonderful work to support inner city Catholic schools that serve low income and very often not Catholic children. Uh, John's work has been chronicled, as Jean's has, uh, in major news magazines. For example, in March 2000, in March 2007, he was profiled in a Time Magazine uh, article. He's been very deeply involved 
uh, in uh, what we too often look at in an ongoing struggle uh, to uh, set things right uh, in New Orleans and the uh, continuing wake of uh, Hurricane uh, Katrina. All is not uh, restored there. John's been at work from the very start in uh, trying to help uh, the victims of uh, that horrible uh, disaster. Uh, in the run-up to the 2000 presidential election, uh, he advised both Vice President Al Gore and uh, then Governor George uh, W. Uh, Bush about the faith factor and about the uh, proposal for a faith-based uh, uh, initiative, and that uh, is consistent with John's whole career of uh, being a person who's looked to uh, by people in people of goodwill who are serious about doing something about poverty and delinquency and crime and drugs uh, by people in both uh, uh, parties for uh, his advice. And then after President Bush's election, uh, John, though himself a registered Democrat, was uh, appointed by the President to uh, the White House Faith-Based uh, and Community Initiatives uh, Directorship. John is the author or co-author or editor of over a dozen uh, books. Uh, those of you who have high school uh, students uh, who have recently had high school students probably know about uh, the book on American government that John does with the great, uh, his mentor, the great <coughs> Wilson, which is widely used in, uh, in AP, uh, U.S. government in high schools, as well as in uh, college uh, courses. Uh, he's, uh, his most recent book, at least that I'm aware of, is, uh, <laughs> is his uh, book, um, uh, the 2007 book entitled Godly uh, Republic, a Centrist Blueprint for America's Faith-Based <laughs> future. Uh, John, uh, too, received his uh, PhD from, uh, from Harvard University. There seems to be a trend. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming my great uh, friend. I think it was the best introduction. <laughs> man, man. Thank you, Professor George, uh, the esteemed McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence. I you I introduce me now. I'm going to introduce you now. Uh, <laughs> turnabout's fair play, speaking of comeuppance and all that. Uh, but thank you, Robbie. It's a great honor to be here. It's a great honor to be here with my friends and colleagues, uh, with Dr. Beverly Frazier, uh, with uh, Reverend Rivers, uh, and most especially with my dear friend, Byron Johnson. Uh, this is a special personal and professional treat to be here uh, with Byron uh, at this event. And it's good to be back at Princeton. Always good to see how the other half lives. Good <laughs> <laughs> to be reminded. Uh, uh, when Byron uh, and I first got to know each other, I think it wasn't uh, too long before I said, you know, I think you were born to write this book. I don't remember how to give you the title, but but uh, <clears throat> he wrote it, and it is it is I. I Reverend Rivers, hold that thing up again, please. There you go. It is an absolutely extraordinary book. It ought to be read uh, by everyone, anyone with any interest at all in the subject of how to prevent uh, and reduce uh, crime, uh, how to improve uh, the criminal justice system and its operations, and much more broadly than that. It's a, it's a major piece of work by uh, a person who is indisputably uh, the single most important scholar of the subject in the country. And uh, it's just a delight and an honor to be here with, with Byron. Now, I'm going to touch upon, you've heard a lot, so I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't know who talks more, uh, preachers, uh, professors, or politicians. Uh, and I think I'm a bit of all three. Uh, so, uh, so uh, but I want to I touch on a, a few aspects of this, and, and maybe, in a sense, even uh, step out in front of my, my, my friend, Dr. Johnson, uh, with respect to uh, one of the issues he raised in, uh, with regard to uh, skepticism that some may have about uh, what's reported in this incredible and great book. So the first thing I want to underline is that I'll, I'll call it uh, BBJ, before Byron Johnson, uh, in that era of the literature. Uh, there were, Frank Collin is right. He's a pretty good guy. As I won't just say as criminologists go. He's a pretty good guy. Um, they're really, it's, it's, it's stunning. It's absolutely stunning if you look at the literature uh, in the field of social science of crime and corrections. And I actually did a bit of what, what Frank did on my own. And uh, let me just quickly report, because I think it's, it's, worth, it's worth being even more specific about this. In 1971 to 1977, Marvin and Wolfgang is the name that anyone who knows anything about criminology will remember the late, great Marvin E. Wolfgang of the University of Pennsylvania, the head director of the Saline Center for Criminological Research, and, you know, uh, 
probably the, the Mount Rushmore figure of his era as criminologists go. And, and Marvin co-edited uh, between 1971 and 1977 three volumes, I mean big thick things, over 4,000 pages in all. Okay, And these three volumes, uh, the Crime and Justice series, were the Bibles, sort of, so to speak, uh, for the field. So every criminologist had these, you had nothing else, you had these three books. In my case, probably stolen. But in any case, you had them on your shelf. Uh, you had them on your shelf. In those 4,000 pages, there were exactly three references, all made in passing, to religion. Three. 4,000 pages. This is the 1970s. I'm going to tell you what they were, because I can't resist. <clears throat> One passing reference was uh, saying that laws against pot smoking probably should be challenged on First Amendment grounds. That was one. Uh, a second was about religion in central India. And the third was about how religion might figure in prison riots because of the insensitivity of, of the staff. That was it, in 4,000 pages, all, all three passing references. And in 1974, different book, uh, The Handbook of Criminology, you probably have this somewhere in your shelves, right? Um, that thing was 1,179 pages, 31 chapters, zero references to religion, zero. Now, sometimes it's, it's suggested that, well, you know, this is sort of the secular, there's, this, there's a rumor, and it is only a rumor, that academic institutions in general and elite secular academic institutions are predominantly liberal. <laughs> and I don't want to debate that, and it's a shocking revelation, um, because it's not, you know, there is a great deal of diversity of opinion, it runs from left to far left. And, <laughs> But I'm the fastest for a conservative, except when Professor George is around. Uh, then I look like what I am, but otherwise, otherwise uh, I look pretty bad. Uh, Robbie mentioned James Q. Wilson, the great James Q. Wilson, uh, who was my, one of my uh, mentors in political science uh, at, when I was at Harvard, and co-authored uh, things with him, including the American government textbook since. It's interesting, Jim Wilson is, is not widely known as a liberal. Pretty much a you know, widely known and well known conservative. And when Jim wrote his, his book in 1975, probably the single most influential book on crime in the 70s, called Thinking About Crime, in that book, there wasn't, Jim didn't reference crime in 75. So it, it went beyond just sort of, you know, secular, liberal you know, bias. It just was really the neglected, the forgotten factor. And even if you look uh, later on in some of, some of Jim's own later work, and you know, there's nobody uh, greater and nobody who was to be more respected than Jim, but, but even all the way through his work with Richard Herrnstein, the late Richard Herrnstein, Crime and Human Nature in 1985, uh, several books he edited with another former American Society of Criminology chair, Joan Peter Cilia, all the way through 2002, pretty much the same story, just passing references, if any, to religion. So, when Byron says in reports, and when others say, when Frank Collins says that this thing has, you know, I mean, there are scores of variables that are studied in this field, and yet religion has, until the Byron Johnson era, which we are now entering, thankfully and finally, has really been left off the table. And it is really true. Next thing I want to uh, touch upon is this issue that, that Byron raised, and I want to maybe be a little edgier about it than my, my friend. Uh, Byron Johnson has been. Because, you know, I don't mainly study uh, crime and corrections. I haven't done that for quite some time. And I've done research on you know, poverty and social welfare issues and, you know, education uh, research and so forth. And when people look at this, they say, yes, that's it's fascinating. There's 273 studies. But you know, they're quasi experimental in character. Now, I'm going to show, I'm going to, I am not an extraterrestrial. <laughs> so I only have 10 fingers and 10 toes. That's about how many purely experimental studies there are <laughs> on any aspect of anything, on any topic in social policy. Because they're expensive to do, they're difficult to set up, they're a difficult issue. That's the first thing. The second thing is, therefore, all of the social science literatures that deal with education and welfare and other issues are 99% quasi-experimental. I mean, you have your ethnographic studies, your case studies, your non-experimental studies, but it's all comparison group studies, okay? That's the A part. The B part is, in this field, 
because of the neglect of the faith factor until now, until recently, it was harder to get studies published. And so the average quality of those comparison group studies in this particular literature, I would argue, is stronger than it is. Okay, just to get published, okay? But let me go one step beyond that. Byron reports and documents painstakingly, yes, there are selection bias issues, yeah, it's all there. And people still say, yeah, but it's, it's not experimental. You heard him say, and it's documented in the book, 90% of the quasi-experimental comparison group studies in this field show an inverse relationship of some sort or another between religion variously measured and crime variously measured, right? Here is what I would say to all of those critics yet to come. Show me another literature where 90% where of all the quasi-experimental studies point in the same direction. Show me one. And I can tell you, I've looked, and there's not one. Not even close. So, you know, it, it's okay to talk about limitations of data and, you know, quasi-experimental and selection bias. Selection bias is, is, plays any programmatic evaluation. You know, when I... When I um, have read some of the early reactions to uh, Dr. Johnson's book, and this issue has come up, it reminded me of my early days in the White House. I'd meet with these people and they'd say, you know, we're very concerned that these faith-based organizations, you know, like this, you know, this Rivers organization in Boston and these churches, synagogues, and mosques in these urban areas, you know, that do things like you know, take, you know, run homeless shelters and do welfare to work programs and do, you know, drug treatment. Again. We're very concerned that money being fungible, some of the money that we give them might spill over into their more purely religious, you know, activities rather than worship services rather than social services. I say, you know, I'm with you. I've been studying public administration at Brookings Institution and elsewhere, you know, for about 20 years of that, I say, I'm actually with you. Let me ask you a question, though. Why are you so worried about this when we're talking about $50,000 to $100,000 grants to do social service delivery among the inner city poor through a religious nonprofit when you don't raise the same concern about universities? Mm. You know, it's rumored. <laughs> that universities, including private universities, get a lot of government money. And I'm sure that if we check and bird dog, no one has ever seen a penny roll from the summer salary component of a government fund from one department to another. That's never <laughs> Corporations in our government by proxy system that have been found guilty of dozens, dozens of violations in the administration and implementation of their programs continue to get government money and somehow, but only when the government by proxy agent dresses in religious drag, then do we get religion about we have to be precise. And I think the same spirit, frankly, and the same bias underlies a lot of the very, yes, there's evidence here, but we have to be skeptical. Yeah, we should be skeptical, but we shouldn't be crazy. The last thing I want to say, and it's an issue that I'm very glad the Templeton Press got uh, Byron to talk about this a little bit, is what happens, not only the question, uh, the finding that religion reduces deviance and crime uh, in, under most conditions, best as we can tell, but also what happens to people who say so in academic life. And let me just, let me just conclude with this. Uh, Dr. Johnson can get into it later on if he wants or not. Let me just say this. I have looked at, over the years, the vitas of a lot of scholars. When I was at Princeton, I was on hiring committees and other institutions. There is no doubt in my mind, none whatsoever, that there is a systematic and systemic bias against people who would take this aboard and who come up with, who, you know, who, yikes, come up with findings that are sort of faith-friendly. There's no doubt in my mind about that. I think, however, we have a new day dawning, and that's where I want to conclude. 
And I think there are three scholars who are going to be sort of, without being sacrilegious, you can just snap my hand, Professor George, without being sacrilegious. Uh, or you can authorize it, whichever you prefer. Uh, uh, that's the way our. Do you, you like the not by faith alone part when he said that? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it sounded good. It sounded good. Yeah. Echoed. 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 Well, um, one is Bob Putnam, Professor Bob Putnam at Harvard, who in October of 2010, just this past October, came out with his book with David Campbell of Notre Dame called American Grace. It's a book that sort of looks at every possible, you know, from every possible angle, you know, what if any difference religion, religiosity, variously measured, makes an individual and group behavior. And uh, read the book; it's a spectacular uh, piece of work, uh, which basically finds that you know, while we may be bowling alone, many of us are still praying together and it has a pretty big impact and a positive pro-social, pro-civic impact. So Bob Putnam would be one. A second would be one of Byron's old colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Professor Ram Kanan of our School of Social Work, who just the other day released a study called the Halo Effect Study, which sort of looked again at the uh, extent to which religious nonprofit organizations in urban areas are supplying social services and estimating this, the uh, sort of eco you know, economic value, if you will, of those social services and finding that uh, all previous estimates, including his own, were, if anything, underestimates. And so that the social service delivery capacity, whether you're talking about preschools or prisoner reentry and everything in between, uh, all those social service delivery uh, capacities uh, are there, they're robust, even though many of these religious groups are still making bricks without straw. But the third, and I think, frankly, the most important of these is going to be Byron, is and is going to continue to be Byron Johnson, because what he has built at Baylor University really is sort of the Roman Jerusalem. That is probably sacrilegious, but. Uh, uh, of, uh, oh, God. Okay. <laughs> is, 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 is the most important uh, of the uh, centers of its kind. And I am just delighted that this book is out. Uh, the only thing is, I require 10 more. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the floor is uh, is open. You can direct your uh, questions to uh, any members of the panel. Please uh, identify yourselves. We'd love to know uh, who you are. Uh, I know who you are, Reverend Sam, but you should tell the folks who you are and about your work in Trenton Prison. Uh, yes, I'm Reverend Sam Hatchison, um, and I am a former uh, supervising chaplain in New Jersey State Prison, and have had the privilege of knowing that cast of characters up there for some time. <laughs> uh, the question I want to ask, um, in 2010, the Brookings Institution came out with a study that documented the flight of the poor, the urban poor, to interim suburbs. And according to the, uh, according to the Huffington Post, or uh, according to the Huffington Post, the Post has said that uh, the largest population of the poor in this country is now in the suburbs. What that suggests is that those uh, issues uh, that, that, Dr. that Reverend Rivers has been dealing with for so many years, that I've been dealing with for so many years, and so many other urban pastors have been dealing with for so many years, are now at the doors of suburban churches. Given that we are in, a, uh, in an environment where uh, funding for such programs as ministry to, uh, 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 mentoring children of prisoners has been wiped off. But you started, you know, you started the Monty program and it was, and MCP came out of that, and it's been wiped off the books, okay, as far uh, in the budget battles in Washington. It seems to me that we haven't heard significantly from suburban churches. And now the poor are right on their doorstep. I'm curious as to how, what the panel feels may be the implications of this going forward. I'll take the first shot. Sure. Um, you know, John did tell me that I was born to write this book, but when I first started, it, am I hot? There you go. There you go. Um, it was going to be an academic book. But early on, it just wasn't working. And um, it had to become a trade book, a book that could be read by a, a lot of different people. And I have felt from the very beginning that the book needed to be read by people in the pews. That's why I think a lot of academics may not like this book very much. 
but I wanted it to, to be something that everyday people could read and then it could be a tool. I'm actually working on a how-to manual now yes. that will hopefully be ready within the next six weeks and will be online at um, moregodlesscrime.com. It's a website. There will be all kinds of resources there. This book basically maps out a lot of things that the suburban church could be about doing, but it doesn't say how. And so we're working on that right now. You raise a great point. I think that there are great hearts in these congregations, but people don't know what to do. They haven't been asked the right kinds of questions. Um, they want to know if you can be an usher, if you can teach a Sunday school class, but no one wants to know if you can help run some kind of a, a program for inmates coming out of prison that need housing, need jobs, and need to figure out how to get a driver's license. So I hope that this, this book would actually uh, meet a need in that way, Sam, that, that people would read it and would find it helpful, and, and, and the how-to manual as well. Uh, before we bring Gene in, can I just on this point, Byron, ask you whether uh, Bob Putnam's book, which uh, John uh, referred to, uh, is not a function for you like a uh, like an offensive tackle who's leading a, uh, a, half, a halfback. I mean, you know, uh, Professor Putnam is, you know, a secularist. He's not a person of, of faith. He went into this as a pure, objective, mm -hmm. just the facts, ma'am, social scientist. And, and he found what he found. I mean, it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be hard, it seems to me, to, to completely dismiss your work given who's running interference for you. Well, that's exactly right. And, um, you know, John knows this better than most, and that is that Bob's been flirting with this for some time now. And um, he's, I think it was maybe 2001 or even earlier when he said that fully one half of social capital comes bundled in various forms of spiritual capital. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I read that, I thought, let's hear more. But he didn't offer any more. And I, I think he's been, you know, forced into writing this new big book that you're right is really opening up a lot of doors and turning heads and and so I've had a number of conversations with Bob since then and it, you're right it's it's a big big help to have him. Pastor? Yeah. Um, uh, Sam, uh, one of the most critical questions in particular for the black community nationally revolves around what we do as black America becomes increasingly resegregated along class lines, mm -hmm. there is a institutional and structural resegregation of black America, which actually outpaces the aggregate segregation between blacks and whites along socioeconomic lines, just in terms of the finance, which is which most black leadership don't talk about, right? That the stratification process among and between blacks is now outpacing the aggregate segregation, socioeconomic segregation between blacks and whites. Now, what that means strategically, and this is fascinating, is that um, John and I were talking earlier about updating the 10-point plan. And one of the ideas updating the plan from 15, 20 years ago is that we now actually have to appeal to outer suburban, middle class, mega churches in excess of a thousand members to send foreign aid into the cities. See, 20 years ago I said uh, that the churches should love Jesus enough to follow Jesus to do the poor. You know, Luke 4.18, let's be the Spirit of Lord's only because the only priest to support. Well, I was impertinent and stupid enough, A, to believe that, and two, worse yet, to tell the churches that they should believe it too. And I was uh, summarily dismissed as being uh, uh, morally and uh, you know irresponsible and possibly defective in character. So now, what I understand is that there's got to be a whole new strategy, so that we have to ask upper middle class black churches to finance what John talked about. What John and Ron Kanan did the research, we find out the cutting edge institutions that do the poor are the Protestant equivalent of the Catholic missionaries, right? They're these small to medium-sized operation That's with serious. high neighborhood residency That's membership. Serious. Exactly, blessing stations. We now have to get the upper middle class black churches who are not going to be caught dead, literally, in these inner city hoods for the same reasons that most of y'all ain't going to be caught dead, right? <laughs> <laughs> in these upper city neighborhoods, right? Uh, um, to set up these ministries because it will be a niche ministry now. 
Now, we're not going to get, look, you know, those big mega churches in, you know, outside of, in Lithonia, Georgia, or that are moving to the sub outer suburbs of Philly, they're not coming back to Ninth and Diamond and Broad Street. We're going to have to finance people who are special ops kind of ministries, the, the way, largely the way the Catholic community does. Their missions, you know, that go into these communities, you know, are special, you know, they have special charisms and, and gifts for serving the poor. We have to do the same thing with the black church. Now, Pastor Rogers refers to the 10-point plan. It was a plan that yeah. Pastor and Professor Miller were instrumental in, uh, what, what did we say, about 20 years ago now? Was it that far? That's all it was from 20 years ago. Yeah, in Boston, yeah. Uh, 10 points to cut dramatically uh, crime and uh, other social pathologies in, yeah. uh, in, in the Boston area, major yeah. effort. Yeah, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, he'll, he'll bring you a. Uh, uh, I can project. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you can't hear me, let me we know. We want to get it on the, on okay. the, uh, yeah. on the video tape. Yeah. <laughs> let us know who you are. Um, my name is Yvette Santiago Green. I'm from the class of 87. Um, I have two questions. Well, one's, one's more of a, I guess, an observation. It seems to me that there, the, there's a great fear of using any type of um, uh, religion-based <coughs> type of analysis for fear that there's going to be a, a, a dramatic impact on your cred credibility as an intellectual. Am I getting that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. The second thing is, there's a lot of studies that say it's not so much religion, but it's relationships. You had mentioned who are the people who are around these people, who are mentoring them, supporting them, giving them whatever positive um, roles that they need. There are studies with regard to immigration that shows that um, immigrants don't become depressed if they have um, multiple community outlets and, and, and organizations. And there are also studies out there that say that children who are more involved in school and after school programs and, and um, sports succeed and don't drop out. So it seems to me that it's not, I'm not and I'm not trying to minimize religion because I don't want to say that's, that's what I'm saying, but is it, is it more so that as people, we are more successful within relationships, and that the lack of relationships and support groups is what puts us on the quote-unquote wrong path? Let me, let, let me go there. The relationship piece is a part of it. In other words, when a dozen upper middle class Harvard graduates turn their back on affluence, Wall Street, and everything else, to go build the relationships that you refer to, you've got to take it back a step. See, the relationship is an outgrowth of the faith. Exactly. Right? So that, see, relationships don't come just out of the air. Something has to motivate me to commit me to a relationship so that when I go into a relationship with the poor in a neighborhood and they shoot my house up. In fact, they murder my church van with 29 shots and the first three shots go in my son's bedroom. Well, that's a deal breaker in most cases. All right? And, and, and for, for most people, that would... <laughs> That'd be a deal breaker. Now, what keeps that relationship intact is the faith factor. So then, when my upper middle class wife, who graduated Phi Beta Kappa, almost had her son die, her firstborn, with the first three bullets, and the reporter asked the next day, uh, Mrs. Rivers, uh, they almost murdered your son because the first bullet went 12 inches from that boy's head in his bedroom. What are you going to do today? Well, I'll tell you, uh, in, in, in the trenches, it takes more than relationship. It takes more than you know, relationship, right? You better have a relationship with something much higher, right, on the vertical, so you can rock that horizontal. Because if you ain't got the vertical, the horizontal ain't hanging. Which is why there are no atheists in these fossils. And, you know, let me just...
say something boring next to that. <laughs> what we try to do in these studies is to isolate the effect of religion. You can never really completely do that, but we're getting better and better and better. And in the last three to four years, we have done a number of studies published in top journals where we are finding that religion, controlling for everything else, has a unique effect by itself. And Putnam finds the same thing, a unique effect. And it's really hard to find something like that that has a unique effect. I think religion does. I, I just want to add, and this is a, a, a slightly different wrinkle, because I, I get it, I think, exactly where you're coming from. and. and uh, much as I like to play uh, a good uh, writer center guy on TV or whatever, uh, <laughs> the fact is I'm a liberal Democrat, you know, except for a couple things. <laughs> <laughs> they are the right things. Uh, they are the right things. Uh, they've, been, they've been anointed in the last, but <laughs> on everything else, I want more government spending and more government. And, and, uh, and my friends, when I got into this in the 90s, my you know, liberal Democratic friends would say, are you out of your mind? I mean, like, you know, you're going to kill the secular service delivery industry. So I kept saying, wait a minute. The data that I'm seeing, okay, is, yes, if, if you gave me a government social service delivery agency that would be in the community, up close and personal, and, you know, doing this work, I don't think I would have given it a second thought. But I was, you know, coerced by the data to see that, and especially when it came to the people who nobody else cared or dared to be around. And now I'm going back now 15, 20 years, people getting out of the joint, I mean the joint for real, you know, people who are, you know, these aren't just bad check writers and so forth, guys are getting out and in serious long bits, uh, kids who are you know, really uh, sad circumstances in their lives, um, say you know, a third of the daycare is being provided by these religious organizations. 50% you know, of the job training is being provided out of the, you know, basically out of the, um, back pockets of these, you know, assistant pastor who's got six other jobs in Camden, New Jersey, and there's nobody else around. And so my friends say, well, but, you know, but we're going to hurt the guy. I said, you know, if the, what we need is, and this goes back to what Dr. Johnson said, the partnerships. This is where the consensus is, I think. Where it began to build a decade ago, but it got frayed for a bunch of reasons, and where I think the research now is finally <coughs> there, and maybe a new day will dawn politically as well, public-private religious secular partnerships. Right, right, that are capable of doing this work. I mean, if 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 we had the kind of public, private, religious, secular, inter interfaith, interdenominational uh, partnerships in California now, people would be saying, well, I mean, I, let's let seventy thousand guys out, and let's take let's see how well we can take care of them, because they'll be better off and we'll be better off. I mean, if we had that infrastructure in place, we could do it. I'm not afraid of 46, I don't, I don't, and it comes from me, take, believe me, I'm not afraid of 46,000 guys getting out if they are going to, if they're you know, selecting guys who are at the lower end, but also who are going to get the kind of wraparound services and get the kind of support. And that's just not going to happen. And they're kind of relationships, right, which it's all about in the end. How you get a job, how you get a kid taken care of, how you get somebody to take the walk with you, for real, those things come from relationships, and you've got to be there. I mean, Reverend Rivers, the famous mantra of "I'm there, you're not." But the drug dealer told you guys, "Why do we? Why are you losing this fight with these kids?" Because the drug dealer told you, "What? I'm there, you're not. I win, you lose." You have to have relationships. The question is, who's there on the ground? And the fact is, those 380,000 churches, synagogues, and mosques, especially in urban America, especially the African American and Latino churches, the unsung heroes and heroines of America. As bad as things are. God help us if they were not there every day making bricks without straw, doing it. Nobody knows just how much you know, they're doing, how much they're, how much the sort of leveraging they're doing uh, to keep things you know, from being even worse than they are. Yes, I, I, just want to, yeah, I just want to make one distinction, and, um, and that is the difference between uh, faith-based organizations and faith-based interventions. Because the organizations come in the form of congregations and mosques and temples and other organizations that are nonprofit with some faith-based mission. So that's the, that's the one thing. The, the other thing that, that, that uh, to, is in play is, is what these services, what services these organizations provide. So the idea, obviously, of the intervention is what is put in place to correct the problem, right? So if the problem is reducing crime or reducing recidivism. What, what is that intervention? So what we see in prison fellowship is that we see that intervention had to do more with uh, religious um, services, right? So Bible studies and 
moral instruction and reading of sacred text and singing and so forth. So in those contexts, the, the, so if I can kind of separate religiosity from, from spirituality, though, though in those contexts, the, the focus is, is on religiosity in the sense that you are engaging in religious activities. But the end is spirituality, and that is that personal individual ascent, right, to the divine of it, to the, something that connects within you that allows you to give ascension, right, to something higher than yourself. So that, that, that's, that's what, I, what I've seen, especially when I read um, uh, your earlier work and the faith factor, that's kind of what I conceptualize as the faith factor. What is that? thing that cannot be explained, which makes us very elusive. I mean, there's dozens, right, hundreds of measures of spirituality and hundreds of measures of religiosity. It's really, well, uh, kind of like all other social uh, aspects, variables, it's kind of hard to put your hand on it. And so faith is one of those things. So on the one end, you have this, the question of religiosity to the ascent of spirituality, and then the other side, you have these religious organizations providing uh, 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 social capital through connection, right? Through support, through providing a faith community that all celebrate you as you uh, progress in your pro-social reintegration, who celebrate you along every step of the way, who are the, you know, kind of along the lines of the AA, you know, I'm having a hard day today, I don't know what I'm going to do. You're right, you're absolutely right. The support, whether it's in a faith context or not, works. But, but what happens in the faith context is exactly what you hear. Uh, faith organizations, especially congregations of mosques and temples, have a unique ability to reach for, because you're in the community. Your mom is probably there. Your dad is probably there. I heard one pastor say that there was not a single person, this is a church in Harlem, right. not a single person in his church that has not been touched by uh, some aspect of the criminal justice system. I mean, not the individual, but their families. I mean, not a single individual. So in one way, churches really don't have a choice. I mean, in one way, you have to respond to, you know, Aunt Bessie's son or, you know, Sister Mary's cousin. You have to respond to that need. So I think kind of making the distinction between what is done within those organizations and social support and what's done in religious uh, uh, activities and the ascent of spirituality have to be made in order to kind of tease out. Uh, the difference that, that you see in a faith situation. Sure, over here. Hi, I'm David Messner, class of 71. I am uh, professor of uh, biblical theology at University of Duke Theological Seminary, so I'm training pastors. <laughs> and we have, of course, a lot of work with uh, missions and uh, various inner city uh, work as well. My question is actually follows up on the relationship question and some of your comments I think very well, but also uh, Dr. Johnson, you mentioned something triggering in the brain. Can you say a little bit more about that? Because uh, from a spiritual uh, theological dimension, it's the metanoia, the, the, the transformation of the mind that sparks faith, or faith is the spark that changes the mind. And without a mind transformation, faith does not grow or it cannot be sustained. And I uh, to me, there's a real correlation there, and that it's, it takes a mind transformation to go from one form of addiction to another form of commitment or a form of life change. Well, to, just to say a little bit more, there, there is this recognition, especially by psychologists um, that do studies in prisons looking at different kinds of treatment programs. And, um, you know, how is it that you can take an offender that, let's say, has a drug addiction or some other kind of problem and rehabilitate them. How do you do this, right? And so in recent years, and Doris McKenzie is kind of the leading expert in this area, they have done studies looking at prisoners saying that something intellectually has to happen in the mind for, for them to make this pivot. Okay, there has to be some kind of a trigger. These are secular social scientists, and they've admitted now that they think religion may well be one of these things that triggers something in the mind, or we might even say in the heart, that would allow someone to begin this pro this, this, this journey uh, for real. And um, so for I think for people of faith, this is, this is almost like, as Jean said, this is so obvious, right? But now for social scientists, they're admitting that there has to be something to start the ball rolling on this process of change. There has to be something meaningful, and faith may well be 
the beginning of a turning point that is huge. And, and there are other ways we can look at turning points, you know, jobs, family, uh, having children, etc. But now there, I, I think that we, I'm not a psychologist, but we, we really need some kind of studies that would help us look at the conversion experience. That's why I don't want to write off conversion experiences for a lot of people that think a conversion experience is um, easily something you can explain away. I think that they can be critical if they're nurtured. Hi, I'm Olin West. I'm a class of 61 <clears throat> and retired psychiatrist. Um, I'm, I'm just curious about whether the uh, panel could comment on um, the pros and cons of legalization of, of street drugs. It just seems to me that that's kind of an elephant in the, uh, in, in, in the situation and just wondered how you all feel about that. Gene, do you want to get on that? I mean, you're on the street. Uh, I, uh, I lived in a, a crack infested, we began our work in a crack infested neighborhood with 40, 47 of the homicides in the city of Boston uh, were committed. And if you were to ask the average rank and file person that had to live with that stuff, uh, let's, 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 let's legalize crack. Right, and see what it does. Uh, the thing you find in these poor neighborhoods, y'all don't know conservative. Y'all don't know conservative. We are no, no, no. We, we, we scare you <laughs> because there are freedoms you have we would not permit in our neighborhoods if we had the power to in, in, enforce the laws. And so the street legalization stuff, see, because see, because our view is that's almost a hypocritical question, because in Bel Air, in Beverly Hills, the drugs are legalized. There is legalization of drugs. If you're wealthy, a cop is not going to roll up to you in your gated community and ask you if you're smoking. What you, what's that coming out your window? Right? That doesn't happen in upper class neighborhoods where the drugs are recreational. Right? So, you know, you do what you do. Now, for those of us who lived on the, like, the bottom third, um, you ask anybody, should we legalize this stuff? In fact, the thing that's sort of fascinating about this, which is interesting, it is only in elite circles that the question of legalization of drugs, I mean, just think about it, right? The political discourse is always some glamorous individuals on Charlie Rose, Right, who live in some <laughs> upper income kind of place. So, we need to, what about the legalization of drugs, right? Some very cool person, right? God bless them. No one asks anybody in poor neighborhoods about this stuff. And you see, we're never you know, interviewed, right? Because, no way. We want law and order and more law and order. Now, we want some justice. So, you just don't crack the brother's head because he's, you know, his head, you know, because he's black. But we need order. And we are very good. Hobbes is real. You know, we, 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 we want some order <laughs> and more order, right? And we throw some justice in too, right? But we order precedes justice. John, I know you, you've thought about this. Yeah, I, my, my view is that when, you know, when you talk about the, the harder drugs, it, it gets uh, you know, very, uh, very uh, hairy very quickly. But one of, the, one of the things that has become clear over the last 15 years, um, I think that's now a consensus point, and it may be, uh, Dr. Johnson uh, will know better, but uh, will correct me if I'm, I'm wrong on this. But one thing we know is that you know, there's a difference between legalization, right, and uh, how you respond to people who are, say, you know, 800,000 marijuana arrests last yeah, year. Right. Okay. Right. Now, uh, you know, my father died in 2002. When he died, he was on 16 different drugs. There is not a clinical study that's ever been done of the interactive effects of those 16 drugs. Okay? And some of those drugs, any one of them was more powerful than pot. Okay? So the idea of using pot smoking, I mean, it's just like, oh, we, we, we've effectively decriminalized it. Well, if you're in North Central Philly, or South Central LA, or Dorchester, Boston, and you happen to be a person of color, and you happen to be involved in doing what, let's again face it, you know, you know upper cross college kids, seem to do uh, fairly, uh, you know, not to say it was abandoned, it was not the 70s. 
but you know, you you would you, you know using those those laws as Velcro for the criminal justice system. So now somebody has a beef and a felony offense, right, right. and you know, and here we go. Right. I mean, that that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, a and then B, we know I think pretty well that punishing you know low level drug dealer Paul does not keep low level drug dealer Peter honest. That's right. Right. That's because there's a replacement effect. Right. You know. You just go and you do the, the 48 deals you were doing on your corner, and you do the 32 he was doing on his. So there's not much of an incapacita uh, inca uh, incapacitation effect. You lock the guy up, somebody else is going to do those deals. Right. Now, I, don't, I think there's, a, there's space now, again, for a, a serious discourse and debate about this <laughs> that w wasn't there some years ago. I, uh, you see this new group, uh, which some have poo-pooed, and I'm a signator to, and I'm proud to be one, uh, this right on crime group. I guess I'm the most liberal right on crime guy there, but uh, but I uh, but you know um, you know uh, Chuck Colson, uh, Pat Nolan, the Prison Fellowship Ministry, former Attorney General Meese. I mean, if you read the statement, uh, they don't go to anywhere near legalization, but they're talking about the need to really radically rethink sentencing and so forth uh, because the data are in, and you know a lot of the mandatory minimums have pro proven to be perverse. Uh, and, you know, the, the facts are the facts. Wherever people were on that uh, 15 or 20 years ago, you know, facts are facts. Um, Professor Frank? Yeah, I just wanted to say specifically about the issue of marijuana, which, you know, if you look at the trajectory of the voting, say, for example, in California, since it was first introduced, it's obvious that every, even though it was voted down, that each vote, uh, uh, the, the percentage of those who supported increased. So it's, some believe that it is inevitable that at some point uh, there will be legalization of marijuana. So there are, um, the discussion around crack and cocaine and other more serious drugs, you, you don't see as much of a debate, right. but definitely along the lines of marijuana. And so one of the um, arguments is that you don't see the violent crime associated with marijuana, say that you might see um, in some of the neighborhoods with, with, the, with the more well, if you want to say more serious or drugs. Um, and so the other question around the legalization has to do with legalization with regulation. Kind of what we find with alcohol, that you can't, you have to be at least 21, that um, uh, you can't walk around with public, you know, with exposed um, beer cartons or bottles. I mean, I don't drink, so it's, I don't even know this <laughs> But <Wow>. open <laughs> container <laughs> ordinances. Yeah. Yes. Um, so right, so you can't you can't do those kinds of things. So the idea I've been trying to get her a drink for years. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have ten or five wine and beer, a little daily kegger. <laughs> but there there is a lot of debate around um, that, that that marijuana is, for example, one of the drugs that really should be considered. Um, for me, though, I you know on the one side, I, I do think that if we uh, support, um, you know, legalization of alcohol with, with the 1920s or so before, um, that it makes sense. But if you but if you look at what's contained, this is kind of a little digression, but if you look at what's contained in a cigarette, you know, just I think it's only less than 30% that's actual tobacco. The rest of it is tar and, and some, you know, combination of other very toxic uh, uh, elements in a cigarette, and so though you know, if you if you grew marijuana in your backyard and you could pull it out and smoke it, maybe the effects wouldn't be as deleterious. Even though there are facts that show that it does affect your lungs in a similar way as, as tobacco and so forth. So, um, but but the, you wonder if if marijuana were legalized, if you would have some of the same issues in, in terms of what is actually used to produce it. I mean, are we talking, you know, some grass that you roll up in smoke, or are we talking something that's processed with only, you know, 20% with this incredible, you know, harmful effects long term? So then, what are the long term effects on health care for the society? What are the long term effects if, if, for those who shoot down the gateway drug, um, you know, argument? For those, you know, how many DUIs do we have this year? Will that increase with legalization of marijuana? Probably, yes. So, um, and the one, I guess to answer your question is, I do think that we're definitely headed, um, more and more states have added le uh, uh, medicinal marijuana, New Jersey, one of them, uh, this year with a lot of regulations. But the point is, states are moving toward it, and I think it's inevitable eventually, sorry. Well, uh, well we have time for just one more uh, question, and right behind you, Brett. I just want to say, Robbie, that um, if in the Madison program, 
if everybody's smoking pot in the office, nothing's going to get done. <laughs> we're here. Hi, I'm Max Anderson, class of 2001, and I'm here with PJ Kim and Sayaskov, who were classmates in uh, Professor Julio's freshman oh, seminar yeah. uh, on saving at-risk urban youth, where uh, uh, rivers came and visited him in age today. I <laughs> 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 more of you. Um, and uh, so we're here for our 10th reunion, and we actually talked about trying to see who would come up, uh, and then we saw you on the schedule, so it was actually a real treat to have you. And um, uh, I don't know if this is fair to say, but uh, hearing the conversation today versus what it was when we were freshmen 13, 14 years ago, um, I was a history major, not math, so. Um, what it, what it, it seems like there's been some progress made. They, they talk about super predators, and, and that was in the news uh, while we were uh, in school. In school, it's, it's not the talk of today. And I wonder if you just a couple of you, but Professor, would like to hear from you. Ten years from now, at 23, in what conversation would you do? You think we'll be having what conversation would you like to be having in a forum like this? Well, I, I, first of all, it's, it's great to see you guys, and uh, you know, uh, it's wonderful. And, and Hannah uh, here as well, uh, 96, Jeremy of 96. See, and I've been doing this for almost 30 years, so, and, and, and Sam I had when he was in sixth grade. <laughs> and you were in fifth, so <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a remarkable Boy, relationship. Uh, um, let, let me say this, you know, uh, the Lord works in mysterious ways. The Lord works in mysterious ways. Um, I uh, think that what we're seeing now is what I'll just call a sorting, a sorting of people uh, and I'll, I'll maybe be a little oversimple about it, but there are people who really do care about um, the future of, of uh, <coughs> most truly disadvantaged members of our society, and there are people who care less or, or not at all. And it's easier today than it was when even uh, when you guys were undergraduates to not care and not be exposed, because you've got 932 channels, and you can watch kickboxing live from the Philippines all day. If you want to do <laughs> or you can get the sailing channel and watch sailing all day. You can avoid people who you don't want to be around. You can avoid social problems now in a way that, despite the ubiquity of the information and so forth, it's never been easier to narrow cast your life. Um, and that includes how we organize our urban uh, settlement systems. Right? Uh, not just racially segregated, but segregated by class to a degree that I think is unprecedented, I'm not demographic. Um, I am hopeful that whether people are brought to the discussion by fear of something, as was the case you know, in my own case of crime, you know, like, oh my God, you know, we need, we need something and none of this stuff is working and maybe the ministers can figure this out or help to figure it out, sort of they were working on it, uh, or whether it's because people think there are positive gains to be made by, you know, including uh, having partnerships on education that involve religious communities. I think the what I hope is in ten years people will, will wake up and say, look, we had we had two big social problems, just name two major social problems back in the uh, you know, uh, uh, early you know 2010 uh, era, and one of the social problems we had had to do with education. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen Waiting for Superman. Uh, we I want to get into that whole uh, we get into the whole debate, uh, but reality is you know in my city of Philadelphia where I grew up. If you're African American and you're male, and you start ninth grade, your probability today of graduating from high school in six years is 49%. Okay? Now, I don't think you need to say anything else. You know, case closed. Two and a half billion dollars. And yet we have a Blaine Amendment in the Pennsylvania State Constitution, and we have Catholic schools closing, and we have 80,000 families, low-income families, who have said, who have entered a lottery for something called the Children's Scholarship Fund, saying, give me just partial tuition, and I will take that partial tuition, and I will go to a non-public school alternative for my child. Just give me partial tuition. 80,000 applications, and because there's not enough money. Just like a way for Superman. I mean, they weren't kidding. That's the way it happens. We had, we've had only, I think, six or 7,000 people win that lottery since 1998. I'm hoping that people will wake up and say, who are we trying to, you know, it gets back to the, you know, to the, uh, uh, to, to what you heard earlier about the, the, you know, all God's children, you know. Uh, if we care about the children and we're, we're more agnostic about means to ends, I think partnerships with faith-based organizations, with education. I also think uh, there's, a, there's another problem that's looming 
And in some sense, you're looking at it. Uh, but the problem is, what are you going to do with these old baby boomers? Especially, you know, ones who didn't take care of themselves. I don't know who that might be. Uh, you, know, you know, ones that are going to cost you a lot on Medicare and Medicaid because they, they were obese and, uh, you know, and did other irresponsible things. Um, do you know how many elderly shut-ins live in central Jersey? Do you know how many elderly shut-ins live in metropolitan Philadelphia? Do you know the demographic explosion of 65 and older is coming, right? Now, I'm going to ask you a question. What are you going to do with these people? Because right now, it's just beginning to hit. It's just beginning to hit with the 65-year-old baby boomers. It's just starting to hit. I can tell you what's happening. I can tell you, it's, going to be the, it's the same story as it was on education. It's the same story on food security. It's who feeds kids in the summer when school's out and school lunch and breakfast programs and school's closed. Who feeds them? Faith-based groups feed them in the summer. Nobody thinks about it. Where do they go? They got school breakfast and lunch over here. Gee, how do they get fed in the summer? Nutrition development services of the Archdiocese of That's where they get fed at 1,300 sites with partnerships with the City Department of Rec and, and, and Parks. Elderly shut-ins right now are being dealt with essentially by churches, synagogues, mosques, uh, local community groups, blessing station ministries. Are we going to get serious about this? Or are we just going to, are we, are we going to have Medicare and Medicaid consume 90% of the federal budget? I mean, we've got to get serious about this. And I believe, that, I believe we are going to get serious. I believe the research uh, that Dr. Johnson has done, that Bob Putnam has done, that others are doing. And I also believe that once we can get over this hiccup in Washington, uh, this polarization, and I think we're going to, I actually think we're going to get over it. That means another panel. I think we're going to get over it. <laughs> once we get over this, I actually think we're going to look back and say, this is the start of something really good. But, you know, uh, as you know, I'm not an optimist. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a glass that's half empty, and the stuff that was in the glass that poured out is toxic. <laughs> uh, this is a Southern Italian heritage. Uh, it comes from living under Vesuvius for over 300 years. So, uh, but, uh, but that aside, I'm optimistic today. I'm ready to be with
middle school from really bad situations, drug addicted single mothers. Right. It was a horrible right. situation. But Dr. Flowers and his wife and their teaching staff had taken these desperate, vulnerable, but very precious young boys and girls and just done magic with them. They shook our hands, they looked us in the eye, they talked to us on a, on a serious level. These were, these were kids who were going somewhere and, and Dr. Flowers took us down to his office and on his office door and all around his office door were stickers. These college stickers that you see like we have yeah. Princeton stickers. Stanford, Notre Dame, Oberlin. These were graduates of this school who had gone on to these great universities. Very unlikely yeah. results, but they were working that magic year in and year out. They've been doing it for 30 years. Now, why were they doing it? Terrence Flowers had, he had degrees like yours, Gene. Ivy League degrees. He could have been somewhere else. He could have been doing something else. So could his wife. But there they were, yeah. working with those kids and because they love Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was mostly black staff, but I'll never forget one woman, she looked like she was Miss Norway. <laughs> and there she was, teaching, yeah, that, yeah. teaching in there. That's and, I, and I have to admit, I looked and I, I said to myself, I, you know, I didn't say to her, but I said to myself, what are you doing here? <laughs> Same story. Same story. She was an evangelical Christian uh, who had a lot, tur turned out she's from the wealthiest families in Dallas. And she was there putting herself at risk, physical risk, to get to school every day uh, to do this. So for me, not being an empirical scholar, not having all the data beyond what I was able to read uh, in, uh, in Byron's book and in Putnam's book, but just as a human being witnessing something like that, you can't help but have your spirit elevated. You, you can't help but sense that it is possible to bring this goodness to John, the people you call the least, the last, and the, and the lost. And that's what these people were doing. And they were, in some ways, kind of ordinary people, you know, just, like, just like us. And if they can do it, we can do it. Before I ask you to join me in, uh, in thanking our uh, wonderful panel, I want to say just a word about the James Madison uh, program in American Ideals and Institutions. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary. We were founded on July 4th of the year 2000, the millennial year here. Uh, at Princeton, some of uh, some of my co-conspirators in founding the Madison firm are here with us. Steve Whelan's here, Luis Telez is, is here, and for, for 10 years uh, we have been uh, bringing, uh, uh, I, uh, I like to thank the highest quality uh, civic education uh, that uh, is being done anywhere in the country uh, to our students here at uh, uh, Princeton University, and I do believe it's had a transformative effect. About the time of the founding of the Madison program, the Carnegie uh, Foundation issued a report really ringing a warning bell about the dire uh, straits into which uh, civic education at the college and university level had fallen uh, all over the country, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the schools that are colleges and universities that are regarded as not among the elite, all the way up to those that are at the top, like Princeton, Yale, and Stanford, Chicago. Uh, and we meant to do something about that at Princeton, and I, uh, I believe our record shows that, uh, that we have. And what you see today, what you saw today, what you witnessed today, is what we do for our students uh, week in and week out throughout the semester. Sponsoring courses, uh, hosting, visiting uh, speakers such as James Q. Uh, Wilson, who spoke at our Bond lecture here uh, last year. Conferences on a wide range of critical topics uh, for uh, American civic life trying to teach students uh, to wrestle with the questions that need to be engaged if you're to be a committed and effective citizen of a democratic republic. Uh, we, uh, we work in a certain sense uh, uh, on our own bottom here. Uh, we do not receive an annual allocation from the general fund of Princeton uh, University, the terms under which the Madison program was founded are terms that require us to raise our budget uh, each year, and that, uh, that budget comes from the generosity of alumni and friends and foundations uh, who want to see what the Madison program uh, is doing happen uh, at Princeton University. Uh, and we are very grateful. I know some of you in the room are among those who have supported us, and we're very grateful for that uh, support. Uh, I want you to 
know what it has done and what it has meant for the students at this university and for the faculty, frankly. Uh, and also that it's set a wonderful example for colleges and universities around the country. Madison program clones now exist at something like 35, 36 colleges and universities around the country, including places like Brown and uh, Duke uh, and, uh, and Emory. Uh, Georgetown University has the Tocqueville Forum very much in the mode of the Madison program, founded by a former visiting fellow of the Madison program. Uh, they're all over uh, and they're growing. So we've, we've really started a, a trend that I think is a very positive thing in uh, civic uh, education. Uh, we do rely on the generosity of alumni and friends, and I hope you'll consider us when you consider gifts to the university. Gifts uh, to annual giving cannot be dedicated to uh, particular projects. Those go into the university's general fund, and we certainly urge all alumni to first think of your responsibility to annual giving. But those who can do a bit more beyond uh, annual giving and are interested in making uh, capital gifts, I hope uh, if your interests are in civic education, and I suspect you wouldn't be here if they weren't, uh, we hope that you will consider uh, the Madison program uh, uh, for, your, uh, for your generosity. And with that, I ask you to join me in thanking Byron Johnson.